Is it harder than you thought? Is it more fun than you thought? It's definitely harder than I thought. Um, <laughs> so, so it's basically saying, if, if you knew it was this hard, you would never get into it. Thinking about space as pure sequence is something that takes a little bit of practice. That's what I realized. Because when you think about modeling space, people naturally think about grids. People have done a lot of clever experiments about the brain. And that's often some a lesson that is missed in machine learning, I think. Blank, 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 something. Blank, 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 something. <laughs> that's the way it is. This is Brain Inspired. When the waiter hands you your bill, uh, should you pay or should you let your date pay? I say if your date is Dalip George, co-founder of the AGI robotics company Vicarious, uh, you let him pay. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds right. Hey everyone, this is Paul Middlebrooks, and today I have Dalip George back on the show. He was on two years ago, and at that point we talked about his graphical probabilistic models that could do visual inference to do things like solve CAPTCHAs. Uh, On this episode, we get an update on Vicarious. Uh, We chat about his experience in general running an AI startup, and then we talk about some of his latest modeling work that explains how our hippocampus takes in sequences of events and turns those sequences into cognitive maps that we can then use to simulate or or model the world and run that model to decide what actions to take. In particular, we focus on the idea in his model that the hippocampus could use clones or duplicates of concepts so that when we're in a given situation that might call for a variety of different actions, we know which action to take. We can use the current context to decide what to do. You'll also hear from Brad Love, back from episode 70, which was about concept learning in the hippocampus, uh, whom I corralled into asking Dalip a few questions. So thanks, Brad, for the questions. You can find Dalip on Twitter, at Dalip Learning, and in the show notes, I point to the relevant stuff, braininspired.co slash podcast slash 87. If you value this podcast and you want to support it and hear the full versions of all the episodes and occasional separate bonus episodes, you can do that for next to nothing through Patreon. Go to braininspired.co and click the red Patreon button there. Here is our conversation. I have some things to play. So, Dalip, welcome back to uh, Brain Inspired. Happy second anniversary, actually. I, I I pulled up the last episode and it's been almost two years to the date since we last spoke. Oh, that is great. Uh, Thank you. Uh, (laughs) Thanks for remembering the anniversary. That's, that's great. (laughs) I, I I feel, uh, you know, I feel good about that. And uh, uh, thanks for having me back again. So I thought, well, you know, I I treat our anniversary, Dilip, like I treat my wedding anniversaries, unfortunately, so I didn't send you flowers. So (laughs) yeah, where where are the flowers? (laughs) Paul, where are the flowers? How could you forget? <laughs> I treat, actually, I use my wife uh, as an assistant here on the show. So I'm going to start off the show uh, ridiculously by playing a very brief segment from the last episode as we closed out our, our last conversation, if, you, if you're okay with that. Yes. Okay. So hang on. Let me get my assistant. Hey, Catherine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You ready? <laughs> Previously on Brain Inspired. Dilip, what can we expect from Vicarious in the next year or two? Well, one, uh, definitely products. One, uh, one thing very rewarding for us would be when our products, you know, start getting used in the real world yeah. and seeing something being used, that is uh, very rewarding. So that is one thing. And uh, we are working on some uh, cool ideas related to how higher level concepts can be learned. And also we, we hope to see some of the things that we, we kind of, champion uh, in terms of uh, data efficiency, causal generative models, and using insights from uh, the brain in a, in a deep way, being uh, taken up by the broader community. Okay, so that's a, do we have like a two-year assessment now. So what do you think? <laughs> how, have you, how have you done? How's it been going? That's great. Uh, this, uh, and 
hearing to me reminded me why I never listen to myself. So that's, that's, oh my gosh! Imagine I have to do it every time I yeah. edit every episode. It's, it's that's absurd. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, so it's a, it's a weird feeling. Um, so I think I think we did all of those things um, that I mentioned in the podcast two years back. Um, so one, our robots are working in the field. Uh, cool. They are getting deployed and the deployments are accelerating. So that is very cool to see. And it is very rewarding to see uh, robots doing work in the field. And as we speak, they are you know picking and packing objects and in multiple locations. Are you selling them yet, or 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 they're functioning? But are you are they product? Oh yeah yeah yeah. We are selling them. Oh. We are we, we yeah. are aggressively selling them. No not not just oh no. We are we are uh, going after cool. the market and we are growing. Um and um yeah. So the number of deployments are growing. Uh we have a you know good uh, sizable sales team now. Yeah. So it's 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 a very exciting time because uh one there is a need uh, for automation now uh, and. Um, there is a recognition from all the players in the field that, okay, this is robots can do these things now, which they couldn't do before. Yeah. So overall, it's a very exciting time at Vicarious. Yeah. The, so I guess um, the last time we talked, you guys probably had a handful of employees, but now you're up to 100. I th- I th- yeah, we are now 120. Wow. Yeah. That's great, man. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It must be so satisfying to grow. I mean, I want to start off talking about vicar- Vicarious a little bit, um, but but there are the other two things that you mentioned in uh, the last episode, which was developing this high-level conceptual model, which is a, a large part of what we're going to talk about today. So that was great. Yes. So that particular one was uh, in relation to a project that we have been working on at that time, how do you learn concepts, higher level concepts? You know, yeah. higher level concepts would be, for example, simple ones would be, okay, two objects are touching. Um, you know, one is above the other. Uh, the glass is half full. Uh, you know, th- those kinds of things. You know, uh, what does touching mean? What does above mean? What is left, right? Um, you know, in a line, in a circle. How how are all these things learned and represented? That that was the question that we were after. Uh, and so we, we did have a good uh, project on that and we had a uh, good uh, success on that. Oh, so we had a paper in Science Robotics about that. It is called Cognitive Programs. You know, that's what we call it. Um, and the main idea there is that concepts are learned as programs and uh, concepts are learned as programs on a very, very special kind of computer. So this is this is a computer that we call Visual Cognitive Computer. And uh, all the pieces that we developed earlier, um, the RCN visual hierarchy, the schema networks for dynamics, mm-hmm. all of those pieces are part of this computer. So because you need to learn programs that can imagine visual concepts uh, and manipulate them in the working memory. So so all these pieces come together and uh, then you learn programs on this cognitive computer. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how concepts are represented. And uh, so this was this uh, paper... Uh, was published in Science Robotics, and it was it was pretty cool because you can now convey uh, an idea to robots using pictures. So you can say, uh, you know, just like IKEA assembly diagrams, right. you can say uh, picture A, picture B. What what happened between A and B? Uh-huh. Do that in the real world. So you have to understand what happened as a concept in the in the picture, and then transfer that to the real world and do the task there. So that's how a that were the demonstrations that were part of the paper, and uh, so that was that was actually pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's great, <laughs> interesting, and the I guess the third thing before we get moving <laughs> yes. here on today's episode is is that uh, hoping that there is more brain like implementation in AI systems, and I don't know what, what do you think that that has come to fruition? I mean, I know you have. At least I'm uh, see. Of course, there is this one track of AI development, which is, okay, let's take existing models or new versions of them and just scale them up, you know, to, to scaling up transformers to get GPT-3 or you know, and, uh, making larger yeah. and larger uh, con nets, et cetera. So those, those are successful tracks and the, those will still continue. But I think in the community, there is a realization that, that is, that's not enough. You want, you need models with more structure, uh, more causal models, uh, feedback is important, recurrent connections are important, explaining away and uh, parsing a scene, all, are, all of those are important uh, ideas. There is 
uh, recognition in the community uh, about that. So I think that part is also happening. I I I I won't be able to say um, okay, just taken over the field, but I, I I would say it is it is maybe twenty percent of the people now recognize that as important. There's some influential. Uh, okay, there's some influence uh, yeah. going on there. Do you do you think that brain inspired AI is overhyped in AI? Oh, this hype thing. I you know it's very hard to get a handle over it. I think. I think sometimes it is misused. Uh, that's I would I would say. Um, I think that's well put. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so uh, you can uh, sprinkle inspiration, biological inspiration, pretty easily on anything. Uh, I had a I had a joke. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I uh, told this joke last time too. But, you know, <laughs> if you if you have a uh, you know convenient and uh, uh, if you if you put a different nonlinearity at the lowermost level. Now you can you can call it the thalamus layer, you know. So right. so so, uh, so, those, so it is very easy to sprinkle that kind of biological inspiration on um, things. But um, so so I think that happens quite often, uh, misusing uh, the biological inspiration just as a sales point, um, because you yeah. know, people are fascinated about how the brain works, uh, and you can use that fascination to uh, you know bring attention to your work. Nothing particularly wrong with it, but still, um, we what we are doing is definitely not that level of bio inspiration. We we definitely dig very deep uh, into into neuroscience and to see what are the principles that we can learn from neuroscience. Um, so so it's it's a I don't like calling it bio inspired anymore. I don't know. Uh, we had to feel it, it almost looks like we had to find some other word. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Be- because inspiration is cheap. <laughs> Well, that's right, and that at least can it can lead to overhyping, right? And and <laughs> yeah, and we've talked about the phrase biological plausibility, and some people really don't like that phrase, but these days because Correct. it's used as a selling point. Got it. But do you think that the AI community does take seriously the notion that there are things to be learned by brain research and emulating uh, brain processes, or or is that still? I mean, is that growing, or is it still? It doesn't seem to have grown at all it, it seems like it's still very much a v- really low priority <laughs> correct uh i would say some subsection um definitely cares about uh using brain as an inspiration and learning principles from the brain um i don't know how deep they go into but at least i can say that their interest is genuine and uh, they they care about that uh, rather than you know just post quote sprinkling of uh bio inspiration they they do care um but i would say yeah you can um the reason is that you still can make good amount of progress uh in deep neural networks and machine yeah. learning without having to worry about biology because of the practical applications those things will continue so it, you know it won't be a giant fraction of the ml field or deep learning field that will be in, uh, interested in learning from biology because you know many practical applications do not need that in fact it can be it can be hindering if you want to for example find a way to model um point cloud data you you know because it's a, it's a completely different um uh, sensory input uh, that's not what humans deal with um you don't e- e- yeah so there there can be so many different ways in which uh, machine learning models can be applied uh, only a small fraction of it is relevant uh, for you know, biological inspiration thinking, and a lot of other applications do not need to think about neuroscience at all, and and that is fine, and that will you know continue. Yeah, well, when you started Vicarious with uh, Scott Phoenix, it was you and Scott Phoenix who started the company, right? Correct. the The mission um, was to develop artificial general intelligence, and along the way, develop awesome uh, products based on the research that that you are doing. So you have this sort of shorter term and intermediary um, term goals of developing products based on the very the, the longer term goal of uh, AGI. Got it. Uh, well, so how's it going? Uh, you know, does it feel like high competition these days in the robotics space? Uh, or, or is there just so much different, wonderful uh, projects to do that um, that it's really not doesn't feel competitive it, it seems like it would feel competitive everyone has a startup AI wants to have a startup AI company perhaps <laughs> that's right well there are definitely many startups in the robotics space uh, but in 
many of the projects that we have been working on, we haven't had any competition. So that could be because one, we have some some unique selling points which others don't have yet. Um, so we we do things that others can't do. Um, so that's one. Uh, and I know we are much more data efficient. Um, th- those kinds of things uh, come into play there. Um, you know, being able to deal with high changeover situations where the the thing the the task changes quite frequently. Um, those are the situations that we are going after. Uh, and uh, so uh, so that gives us an edge in terms of you know what our systems can do. And second, I think it is also true that the space is very big and fragmented. It is not like oh, okay, one company can just go and attack all of that market at the same time. So, mm. um, so I think bo- both both things come into play here. But so, so maybe you can just describe your robots and how they function just really briefly, you know, to find a thing, pick it up, move it across, put it in a box. I mean, that's a very simplistic way of saying it, but maybe you can describe it a little bit better. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, multiple product lines here mm-hmm. and, and they all work uh, together. Um, so uh, the kind of problems our robots uh, solve are uh, kitting, uh, packaging, uh, palletizing, uh, and uh, sorting. Uh, and, and, you know, there will be more um, such applications, uh, but this, these are the four things we currently uh, focus on. So these are all manipulating objects yes, in a three-dimensional picking up space. and manipulating objects. Um, mm-hmm. So it is, it is not uh, just uh, picking objects. It is being able to pick and manipulate objects. And and also assembly. So we also do some uh, mm-hmm. assembly tasks, which are on the manufacturing line. So all of these, you know, as you mentioned, involve picking up objects, being able to orient them correctly, and uh, you know, p- putting them in in the, in the right place. Um, and sounds very simple. Uh, you know, a five year old can do it uh, very easily, but it's it's an extremely hard problem to do it uh, reliably and at speed uh, required for an assembly line. And and what we do is we typically go into a warehouse or an or an assembly line and look at okay this is this is a line that requires uh 15 people now and we can we basically redesign that line to be a combination of robots and people and now we basically say okay now we can accomplish that same task which is done on that assembly line using six robots and three people or something mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. and and so that uh, makes it uh, much more efficient to do the task. Um, it becomes uh, from the warehouse or uh, manufacturing line uh, point of view, their labor supply becomes much more predictable, and that's that's a big big problem that they have. Um, it's um, the availability of uh, predictable labor. M- most people, you know, these these kinds of work is quite repetitive. People do not want to do that task, so right. they come in, uh, they stay for a few days, and they leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so being able to do those tasks, the availability of labor, which they can, uh, you know, turn on and off as they need. Uh, that's something they they appreciate a lot. And so I would say that's that's the biggest service that we are providing. So I know that the the research that you do feeds into the products that you make and, you know, vice versa. Um, how, you know, how much time do you spend? And I know everyone has different roles in the company, but maybe yeah. you personally, you know, how much time do you spend thinking and working on the product side and making something practical application wise versus thinking about the larger picture of how the hell to get to AGI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this, this varies. Uh, so this depends on uh, what is important to the company at that time point. Um, sure. So I would say in the, in the last <laughs> six, eight months, I've been more than 80% on product and no good, man. Uh, it's no pro- good. Product and sales, you know. So it's not. Uh, I, I've been doing <laughs> enterprise sales um, uh, in the uh, beginning of this year. Uh, yeah. So that's that's what I was uh, focused on in the beginning of the year. Uh, then I I would say shifted um, to a mix of sales and product related improvements um, in the middle of the year. And now uh, I think we are at a point where I can kind of uh, switch back to research. Uh, for for a few months, uh, and then yeah. we'll see. Yeah. So it's it's a kind of uh, a time waiting. And how much time are you spending on the AGI comics these days? <laughs> <laughs> Very little. That's when I when I get really angry or frustrated <laughs> about something. <laughs> That's great. I I mean that must be a uh, a really nice diversion. Uh, you know, ha- just as a very offbeat question how important is humor to you? Uh, you know, in all of this and and just attacking your world because 
you have a good sense of humor and it shows you you do you draw them the, these comics yeah. that you make and you post to twitter and stuff are they hand drawn on like a tablet yes, thing yes. yeah yeah um yeah. and and so uh, yeah you make jokes about uh recent developments toward agi and the uh you know the foibles of uh, the follies of many of our attempts and and things of that nature. So that those are fun. That must feel good to be able a relief as a, a pressure release or something. Correct. Yeah, I think um, if if we take these things too seriously, if we can't laugh about uh, right. things, then yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's <laughs> there's no point. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, um, I I think this is also something I learned from uh, Donna Dubinsky. Uh, She's she was a, a you know uh, the CEO at Numenta. She she ran Palm basically. She is the you know one of the most fun people I've I, I've known. Like uh, so uh, so you can be in a leadership position in a company and you know even take it IPO and have great success and still have great humor, right? And and even in even in the leadership meetings there, it used to be, yeah, it used to be fun. Uh, uh, so you you would crack jokes. You would of course have tense situations, but you would you would still crack jokes and uh, and and just uh, be lighthearted about the about the problems. You will, you know. Uh, so that's um, uh, I, I find that to be uh, a very good approach. You know, it's yeah. it's not always like that. You know, there are serious problems uh, often, but still you can laugh at it. I mean, it's also just a nice way to scratch your artistic itch. I mean, I, I often consider myself half artist anyway. <laughs> that sounds so ridiculously pompous, but, um, you know, because the scientist is an artist in some sense. And so you, right. you are exercising your your artistic, your artistry, I suppose. But then uh, creating those comics is a very direct and, um, I don't know, satisfying Seemingly satisfying way to do it. So that's fun. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't know who, who even reads it. I, I I have fun creating it, and uh, my <laughs> wife enjoys it. And sometimes my kids can also understand it. So, oh, so good. <laughs> yeah, as they get older, they can understand it more. Yeah, yeah. So going back to uh, like when you guys started Vicarious, and um, you know, you you have this long term goal of of creating AGI, but you realize you do need to create products along the way. How do you know what the right product is to create, right? So, how do you know, how did how did you come to the conclusion that these robots, um, I guess they're robotic arms for now, right? Um, yeah. And uh, how did you know that that's that's the right market fit, etc.? It's it's an iterative process. Um, so you you have to kind of um, based on prior knowledge and based on the match to the problem. So you know we have considered uh, different problems before. Robotics was a good fit for AGI or AGI milestone because you know we want our our AGI. Uh, you know we have a different take on general intelligence compared to many other other groups working on this one. So for example, we don't believe that you can just scale up a language model and and get to AGI. So for us, being able to interact with the world, having you know being able to understand the physics of the world, being able to simulate that physics in your mind and recalling those things at the right moment with the right you know appropriate prompt um those are all all part of uh, building agi i don't know whether i used this example in the in your previous podcast uh, it's okay. if it was I did, 2 years or, ago <laughs> <laughs> if i uh, edit me out if that is the case uh, so uh, uh, i always give this example uh, when i talk about why why uh, vision is important and perception is important and why sensory motor interactions are important. Uh, if I if I tell you a sentence, uh, John pounded a nail on the wall. Mm -hmm. And if I then ask you a question, was the nail vertical or horizontal? Um, so this is, you know, this is purely natural language right. in, in, the, in the way the question is posed. But the way humans solve it is by actually imagining that scene. They they imagine the scene of John holding a hammer and pounding a nail on the wall, and they read out that answer from that simulation. Right. Of course, you can solve it with a lot of data in that particular setting, but you know there are so many different variations of this problem that I can ask. And uh, being able to solve that, you need to be able to access the knowledge that you have stored in your perceptual and motor systems, uh, and and be able to query that with language. Um, so that's the way we think about it. And uh, in that way, robotics felt like a natural fit because, of course, it is uh, embodied and you, you're starting with perception and manipulation as the building blocks and being able to connect from 
perception to concepts and then finally to language. That's the path that we want to take. Um, and that's the path that we have been pretty much following. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, the, the first part of that, what gets productized there is, is the basic manipulation ability and basic picking and packing ability without any concept understanding. But as, as our AGI stack gets more and more sophisticated, um, then you can think of being able to um, give an instruction to a robot as simply as, okay, pick up the red objects and put it in, in the blue box. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and or make make the assembly like this. Uh, rather, you know, right right now we have to program those things. So, but once once robots start understanding concepts, we will be able to tell them those tasks in a, in a more direct way. Um, so th that's a that's a path that we want to uh, go on. And so that's why we chose robotics as the as the domain. Now, which products that you want to build in that domain? That we always find out by talking to customers. Ah, uh, okay. In fact, it's a sales team that tells you what products that you need to build. Because they find out from the customers that we don't need drones yet. Right. <laughs> and, and, and what are the specifications of the, the product? You know, so what, what, what are the important pieces? Because the, you can always build a product that does something very, very uh, well, but does not match the, the requirements of um, what is needed in the field. So, so that feedback loop of the sales team talking to the customers and, and feeding that into the product team, that, that is an important thing that you have to establish early on in the company. Is, is there something, first of all, I want to ask, is it easy for you to tell uh, when someone has a really bad AI startup idea these days? Oh, oh, oh even, you know, that's very hard. Um, you must get pitched a lot of ideas. Like, hey, Dalip, I've, I've got this great idea for an AI startup, you know, right? Yes, yeah, so people do come and brainstorm. Um, about ideas, but it's, you know, usually uh, the way people look at it is even if you start with a bad idea, you can change on the way. Um, so usually, you know, when uh, VCs uh, look at uh, startups uh, or pitches, it's not just the idea. It's also the people that they look at. It's the team that they look Willing at. Willing to act on it and, yeah. Right. And, and so there are so many startups that started with the wrong idea but, you know, based on what they observed, they changed uh, and became phenomenally successful. So um, there is, yeah, um, it's okay. Uh, it's great if you have the, the right idea from the very beginning and, and go about it and you hit success. Great. Happens very, very rarely. Uh, often it happens, you start out on the wrong foot, but... You you change as you go, uh, and you learn with feedback from the world, and uh, and it's it's usually that that grit that you know VCs are looking for when they when they look. Um, uh, so it's not just just the idea; it's also the team and how how people can change and how resilient are they. Uh, those are the kinds of things um, I would look for. Has there been anything that has sort of surprised you along the way in terms of? Is it harder than you thought? Is it more fun than you thought running a startup and being involved? Because you just, you know, like, I don't like sales, but that's a necessary part. And you just spent 80% of your time on, you know, the sales aspect of it. And maybe you love sales. There are people who do, you know. Yeah. Is there something that is surprising that um, would be a, a gem of a, a nugget of information for people? <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely harder than I thought. Um, <laughs> so, it. so it's basically saying if if you knew it was this hard, you would never get into it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. so in that way, not knowing it was hard was good, you know. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. So it's definitely uh, way harder than I thought. Uh, running startups is uh, extremely challenging. So there are all kinds of problems that happen every day. Uh, uh, and as you grow, there are you know, uh, of course, you have more resources to handle problems too. But, you know, um, so it's, it's uh, keeping a level head through that time is sometimes uh, tough. The different roles, I enjoy playing those different roles in some ways. And I, I have never, um, so this is something I, I find, I never complained about work. <laughs> so okay. uh, whether it is, you know, fixing a bug, you know, way deep down in the assembly code, or uh, whether it is writing papers or anything, I, I've always enjoyed whatever be the kind of work. Uh, so I, um, because uh, once you get into the you know into the problem, there is something interesting there. You know, some fascinating yeah. oh. aspect of the problem. So I I never get into this uh, thing of saying, oh, that is beneath me, or 
uh, you know, wh why do I need to write protection quality code? I will write only MATLAB or those those kinds of things because right. each of those problems teach you something. So, uh, and and I re genuinely enjoyed tackling that aspect of that problem that time. So, and and similarly, sales. Um, I really enjoyed working on sales as a problem uh, to tackle. It, it's a problem to optimize to figure out how to do right. it best as well. E yeah. Exactly, that's a great perspective to have. Still, I wouldn't want eighty percent of my time devoted to it. I think I don't know. I don't know. We, so, so yeah. I, I have a I have a joke there. Uh, okay. All the your experience of publishing papers in journals. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of the uncertainty, uh, the 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 arbitrary delays, editors just vanishing, um, <laughs> arbitrary review comments. All of this prepare you for a unique job: enterprise sales. Oh, nice. <laughs> I believe that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And that's, those are unpleasant things actually on, along the way. Many of them are, you know, the, the publishing. Right. right. Okay. So, um, all right, let's, let's get back into uh, a little bit of science here by way of vicarious still in robotics. Uh, when you give talks, you define intelligence as uh, the ability to model the world and to act on the world. And yeah. you make, uh, just like you were talking about before, about the robots and their capability now versus what they'll need in the future. Uh, so there are two questions. Well, and you make this distinction between old brain and new brain. And old, yeah. brain, old brain being this sort of stimulus to response uh, mapper that um, you, you play this uh, lovely video of a frog um, uh, reaching its tongue out to squash flies on a, an iPhone, and then that's your finger it bites, right? <laughs> well, not mine. <laughs> oh, that's not yours. Okay. Uh, it's some YouTube video, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a YouTube video. I thought you actually yeah. made that. Anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> and, and that, that's an example of old brain kind of mindlessly mapping the stimuli of the flies uh, onto the, you know, the response, the action of jumping and trying to uh, tongue down the flies. Uh, whereas the new brain, uh, you see as more of the cortical, uh, the neocortex and the capabilities that ne the neocortex brought in with, um, especially with, you know, mammals uh, and the expansion in mammals and, and now humans, because we're the best. Um, but, and so what you're building here, what the, the, the goal is to build new brain into these robots. Um, do, first of all, do we know enough about old brain yet? Uh, because old brain's pretty impressive already, right? Do we yes. know enough about old brain or will learning more about old brain still inform AI? So my take on that is learning about new brain will be easier than learning about old brain. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the reason being um, the old brain circuits are too clever and each of them can be very highly optimized for each, you know, the, the particular niche they are in. And it's an amalgamation of all those circuits. Um, uh, and uh, reverse engineering, those can be really hard because you can, you, you know, you have to think of it as, you know, somebody somebody very clever wrote a piece of code. Uh, and now you have to reverse engineer that. Uh, and, and and it is very uh, written close to the metal. Like, you know, they are, they are using uh, some esoteric property of the hardware to accomplish a task. And, and you know, over, over millions of years, these have become really um, intricate circuits. Uh, and whereas the new one, is more more general purpose and it's it's more like python code <laughs> and if you want to take an analogy uh, and so it will be easier to and so rather than being uh, idiosyncratic uh, and and being tuned to a particular problem it's it's more of a general architecture from which you can hope to learn uh, general principles in a much more easier fashion compared to reverse engineering the old brain circuits so i would say we don't know a lot about the old brain and probably we won't uh, because uh, it is much easier to reverse engineer the neocortex. I mean, does that matter though then? Do, I mean, essentially we can have like, these lower level stimulus response mapping functions in AI without learning anything about old brain perhaps, correct? Correct, correct. Okay. So you can, you can train, you know, when you want uh, a particular function, you can of course train a deep neural network with lots of data. Uh, or you can use combination of deep neural networks and evolutionary algorithms to come up with um, a circuit for that function. And we don't necessarily need to reverse engineer uh, old brain circuits to, to accomplish those um, application-specific circuits. Okay, so back to the robots. Um, right now, they're in old brain mode, and you you hard-code the new brain-like features, right, that, that they're 
implementing? Well, it, it's it, it's definitely not in the old brain world in the sense that you know we do have a perception system which is based on you know more. So, for example, RCN is deployed in the robots. So, so that is more like a uh, new brain. And um, also, the robots plan. Um, they they are not they are not just doing reactive motions. They plan. Um, so, so that that is uh, more like a uh, new brain. But there are, of course, reactive components in their motion, etc. And and um, so, th- I would say it has both old brain and new brain components. Okay, so you, so you're building in. I mean, I know that these, these, this is not a hard line distinction. It's more of a a way to sort of conceptualize the different Correct. systems. And and you consider like deep learning old brain type of process, right? I mean, that's a story I say, right? It's yeah, a, I know, uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you have to be very specific, or else you'll, you'll get in trouble, right? Uh, so. Correct. I have to. I have to be very specific to say it is current deep learning. It is <laughs> so. <laughs> it is. It is the um, you know feed forward neural networks that you have been training, um, and and uh, but once you put more structure into the network, once you have recurrent connections, once you have feedback. Uh, once you start using graphical model concepts like graph neural networks, um, so then then we are talking about different, uh, you know. Uh, so I have to be very very. Spe- I have to. So it is not deep learning will always be like that. No, that mm-hmm. that's uh, that would because I don't know exactly where the where, where the field is going. Um, but many of the current circuits and many of the current ways in which we are applying things uh, definitely look like the old brain system because it is. A stimulus response system. We are we are not training world models in deep neural networks. We are training to answer a particular query. We are you know we basically give a set of inputs and say here is the target function, and we we gradient descend on to answer that target function. Um, so in that way, it is definitely very much like uh, old brain. Uh, and what we want to do instead is here is a bunch of data, model it, model mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. Which is uh, uh, underlying that data, and then we should be able to ask queries ad- adjust at the test time without having to train specifically for that query, and and that would be more uh, new brain like. Uh, but we don't we don't do that that kind of thing uh, much in current deep learning, but it, but it is trending towards that that thing. But you know, um, right. definitely not the, the the widely applied models are not like that. They are trained for a particular query. That's good. You have to be really careful, or else you'll you'll end up in a long conversation on Twitter where everyone misunderstands each other and is uncharitable to each other's ideas, and it never ends. So yeah, you have That's to be right. very specific. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's talk some modeling. Uh, some cognitive ma- cognitive maps. So cognitive maps is uh, this is this is the um, I don't know. It's, it just seems so prevalent these days. In it, it's like the uh, the holy grail. It seems to be the holy grail right now of is, figuring is out. Uh, I I don't know. I, I just see there's a lot of people working on cognitive maps and the navigation um, story, everything like that within that realm has seemed seems to have exploded. Yeah. Anyway, there's this question of how we form cognitive maps and and the structure of the representations that those cognitive maps use yeah. to do things like navigate and plan and form abstractions and concepts and, and model model the world essentially. Um, so you guys recently released this paper, Learning Cognitive Maps as Structured Graphs for Vicarious Evaluation. So one issue in forming the representations um, that a cognitive map can use, uh, and this is a very specific issue that the paper addresses, is that you can be in seemingly the same situation, uh, but it calls for a different reaction. So for a terrible example, you know, when I'm younger, growing up in uh, what I don't know, high school, something like that. Um, and there's a um, there's a, a girl, and uh, she a, a guy, a popular, good looking guy, comes and talks to her, and she thinks, oh, it's uh, really sweet. Uh, and then five minutes later, an unpopular and maybe not as good looking guy comes and says the exact same thing to her, and she says, oh, that's creepy, right? Yeah. And <laughs> so these are the exact uh, same situation, but she has a different reaction and goes about her business differently. A lovely yeah. social <laughs> example of this uh, idea. Okay. And you guys use this. Um, Never happened to me. So, you know, I, I, I won't be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. Am I getting too revealing here? Yeah. 
uh, <laughs> I, I was never either of those guys because I, I couldn't go talk to the girl, you know? So, yeah. Um, but anyway, that's, that's a terrible example. Um, and, and the way that you guys go about solving that kind of problem where you either have uh, the same situation um, perceptually and, and or socially or whatever, you know, whatever sp- space you're navigating in your cognitive map, um, but you need to react to them differently. And on the other hand, you can have completely different situations, but you need to, um, they call for the same action to come about. And there's, yeah. it's a problem to know how, or a challenge to know how uh, the brain would implement that solution. Um, yeah. The idea is a uh, different context call for uh, different reactions. And you guys do this through cloning and merging. And so that's, that's what I'll give you the, the floor now to uh, Got take it, it from yeah. there. Uh, yeah, so the the core problem um, is how do you uh, learn mental maps uh, from purely sequential experience? Uh, so you are you are experiencing the world purely, you know, uh, temporally. You know, it's it's one instant at a time. Uh, observations come in, but from these observations, you are able to make uh, maps which are two D, three D space, some arbitrary space, or you know, in conceptual space. And the trouble is that you know, trouble is exactly what you pointed out. This, these observations are aliased or de- degenerate. The same observations can map to completely different settings. You know, the, the same input observation uh, can be coming from many different contexts. So how do you take these observations and uh, learn the, the latent context in that? And, and what, what is the substrate for representing the, those latent contexts? And, and, you know, how, so, uh, and then how do you pull out the relevant uh, context when when an observation comes in and how do you handle uncertainty in all mm-hmm. these settings etc those are those are the core problems and that's what we tackle in the paper yeah and um what you guys use is a clone structured cognitive graph uh, yeah. a graphical probabilistic model is it a graphical probabilistic model or is it a sequence probabilistic model it, both um so okay. It's, it, okay. It, it it is a probabilistic graphical model and and uh, it is modeling sequences, so it is it's definitely both. I would say, yeah. So it being a probabilistic graphical model is important in this setting because that's what allows it to um, one handle uncertainty in the inputs and also do do planning as a natural property of the model. Like you know, planning is not something you have to think about separately from the model. Um, right. If you have the model, uh, you can use message passing in that model to plan so you can for example imagine a goal state you can you want to say i want to be in that goal state and i am in the current state here and uh, how do i get to the goal state you can uh, basically just send messages forward and backward uh, and uh, the model can then figure out uh, okay these are the steps i need to take to go to the goal state so that is all part of the model so um, so you don't need to think about planning as a separate uh, thing uh, from the model. So graphical probabilistic models are almost like, do, am I thinking of them? Because I because my familiarity with them is also much less than I'm familiar with like artificial neural mm-hmm. networks. But uh, the way I kind of think of them, and please correct me, is that every node is, so in, in an artificial neural network, every node is like a quote unquote neuron or unit, right? And then... Um, but every node in a graphical model is stands for a higher level concept, so can almost be thought of as a of, of a less granular version, or almost a little network in itself. Uh, and then these networks are connected um, and represent the probabilities of some assertion or whatever the node stands for being true. What, how active it is is a probability for how true that assertion might be. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. So yeah, so each node. You can think of it as representing a concept, and a uh, concept can be as simple as okay, is a pixel being on, uh, yep. or is an edge being on? Then the edges between those nodes are representing the relations between these concepts. If if a pixel is on here, is a pixel in the neighborhood likely to be on? And similarly, is there a latent uh, higher level feature that explains the you know uh, from which these two pixels are? generated so they mm-hmm. are they are both generated by a longer line being present and that line is a higher level feature um so so it's a, it's a it's a network of concepts like that and and what uh people uh, might be missing if you're not familiar with probabilistic models is that even though these connections look 
uh, like the the edges look like the ones we draw in a neural network. Each edge is bidirectional, so it right. is not it is not the influence is not just one way. Um, so in a in a neural network, when we draw the neural network, yeah, the the messages propagate uh, or the activations propagate in a in a unidirectional uh, way. Whereas in a graphical model, the influence is bidirectional. Each edge uh, has a bidirectional influence. So when you when you translate that graphical model to actually be implemented like neurons, then each node will be represented by a set of neurons because there has to be messages going in both directions. Um, and uh, um, so that's something people who are not familiar with graphical models sometimes uh, miss. Uh, and uh, I would say being able to abstract out that relationship between concepts as, as a knowledge network and then being able to treat inference on that in a, in a coherent way is one of the strengths of graphical models. In neural networks, you are dealing with uh, purely inference all the time. There is no knowledge representation. So, I mean, that, that's is it right to say that something inherent then in the graphical models is that there's more assumptions built in, more structure or bias um, re related to cognitive function built in as opposed to the tabula rasa type style of a deep neural network? Uh, I would say more it is easier to put in those assumptions in a in a more rigorous way in the probabilistic graphical model because you you know when you when you when you specify the assumptions you know what you're talking about you know it's it's easy to put that in uh in deep neural networks it is you know you are putting in assumptions in deep sure. you can put in assumptions in deep neural networks in a in a more indirect way you, there will be there will be some structural assumptions you make about the neural network uh, that you put in but so many other things can affect it so it is not just the the things that you put in, the kind of data that you show, uh, then uh, the training dynamics, all of those things can affect what what the assumption actually meant. Uh, because uh, so what you put in, thinking that this is what you want to have, need not be the reason why the network produces an output. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas in in graphical models, it's much more controllable. Okay, so let's let's talk about cloning and merging because the so the solution that you guys uh, came up with to learning these uh, representation, the, these cognitive maps, and accounting for different contexts and being able to traverse the map differently in different contexts, a solution that you came up with is to essentially clone some nodes, some graphical yeah. nodes, and or merge them. Maybe you can explain, and I don't know if it'll help because you guys uh, <laughs> perform about 100 different tasks to uh, show <laughs> the robustness and the capabilities of these uh, graphical networks. And I don't know if it would help to talk about one of some of the tasks or maybe one of your, you know, your favorite example of what task it performed to dem to talk about the, how the cloning works. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I can I can take a step back. When I used to read hippocampus literature earlier, I used to be very, very confused because there are so many different phenomena and there are so yeah. many different cells. There are place cells, there are splitter cells, there are time cells, there are landmark cells, boundary vector cells. There are all these kinds of phenomena recorded in the hippocampus. And, and once I get into uh, reading that, you, you realize how wide the field is. So I, you know, I, I never used to think too much about hippocampus before. Uh, it's, it's a memory uh, system. You I, know. Was, I, was, I was the a, same way. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's the way I thought, oh, yeah, you can, you know, there is a cortex and it's storing, storing pointers from the cortex and uh, recalling them as needed. Uh, that's the way I used to think about uh, hippocampus. And then... Uh, then I happened to read, I think this was around uh, the time of uh, death of uh, Eichenbaum. Um, oh. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when I started reading some of his papers. And uh, then I found that, oh, the kinds of pictures that he has drawn in the in the paper, he has some very, very vivid pictures of how a rat would inter interpret a, you know, a field of uh, objects. Um, and, you know, th those had many similarities with, a sequence model that we have been working on. That was, mm. that was, you know, we did not start uh, that model for modeling the hippocampus. Well, the, are you talking about the HTM work? Correct, correct. It was, it was related to the the previous um, sequence model that had I had done at Numenta, but we we found a uh, different way to learn that, and uh, so that was much more effective. Um, and so when I started reading these hippocampus papers, I started seeing that okay. These these pictures look similar to the concepts that we are playing around with, mm. and then then I I read one paper that was that was the killer. This was from um, Yuri Buzaki's uh, Buzaki's lab. 
it it put it so emphatically, basically saying that hippocampus is a sequence learner, uh, mm. and and it's just sequencing contentless pointers, you know. So it's not um, it's ordinal sequencing. It, it, it you know there is no um, it, it's just as um, unrelated things as A and B and C, uh, you know, being able to sequence them, ordinal sequences. And and he put it so emphatically in that paper that uh, that's when I started taking this seriously, saying, okay, maybe we should think about this uh, sequence learning idea that we have and see whether that would be a good explanation for uh, the f- different phenomena that we see in the hippocampus. And then once we started looking at it, uh, then it was it was pretty interesting, you know. We we did many of some experiments that we were not doing before. One example of an experiment is um, a rat uh, takes a random walk in a room, and the only distinct observations in that room are in the boundary. So so at the at the edges of the room, of course, the rat gets different sensations. Maybe it touches the wall or it sees the the boundary of the of the room. Uh, but in the middle of the room. The sensations are exactly the same. You know, you are. It's mm-hmm. just seeing blank, 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 uh, and and then uh, and the rat is just walking randomly in this room. Right? There is no because it doesn't know what the room is. It, you know, if you place it in the room, it's, it's just walking randomly. It's just getting sensations, and the sensations are blank, 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 something, blank, 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 something. <laughs> That's the way it is. And and then you you feed that sequence into our model. And it can learn the actual layout of the room uh, and and come up with a graph saying, okay, he, it actually looks like the room. Um, and it, it is able to learn that because it is able to take all these different blanks it sees in the middle of the room and put it in different contexts. And, and uh, all those different blanks are from different contexts because they are at different distances from the boundary. Mm. Uh, and And... Uh, and it is able to automatically figure that out and put that into uh, different contexts in the model. And this is what we call cloning in the model. You know, you you take the same sensory observation and copy them into different higher level uh, states. They are all tied to the same observation, but they are differentiated by the context uh, that are flowing into them. Uh, and this cloning idea, it turns out, comes from a... A uh, reasonably well-known compression algorithm, uh, text compression algorithm from the 1980s, um, and uh, it was it was it's called dynamic Markov compression, and it was it was used in that setting, and uh, but then we found a much better way to train that model. Um, that mo- particular model was just using splitting as a way to train the model, but we found a much better way to train that model, and that's what uh, led to the cognitive maps paper. I think this is probably a good place to um okay yeah i think so so i had um i didn't tell you who i had uh, a previous guest um record themselves asking a question uh, uh, of you of, of this particular work and um actually so it's it's brad love and he recorded two questions because uh he's a, an inquisitive guy so with your permission uh, i'd love to just play his we'll, we can t- we'll do them one by one play his questions and then you can address them however you'd like um, but maybe like after the question, you can kind of un- unpack it and then answer it. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Here's the first one. Hi, Paul. Hi, Dilip. Uh, this is really exciting work. There are analogies here to what's going on in concept learning. For example, Mike Mack finds in his 2016 PNS paper that the same stimuli or percepts give rise to different similarity structures in the hippocampus when different concepts are learned which seems analogous to the path dependence or notion of context in your work. Working with this analogy, I have some questions. Um, In concept learning, there's not a fixed set of representational units. Instead, the problem dictates the complexity of the representation. For example, surprising errors can result in recruiting new representations. Likewise, in Bayesian clustering models, there are notions like the Chinese restaurant process, Dirichlet processes, other kinds of infinite mixture models. Instead, you have a fixed number of contexts or clones. Uh, why did you make this choice? Is this a hard limit, a theoretical commitment, like a capacity limit, or is it an implementational decision? Uh, it seems the number of clones should vary depending on the problem. Like a highway would need many clones with everyone going somewhere different, whereas a neighborhood street ending in a cul-de-sac would need very few clones. I see you have a merge redundant clones, and again, wonder whether this is a theoretical or a practical choice. 
Okay, that was a long question, but you you got the gist. Yeah. So the the question boils down to, you know, yeah, different different problems will require different number of clones. And I should I should have prefaced this by saying I had Brad on the show before, and we talked about his sustain model of you know learning concepts via cluster his clustering models of learning concepts in in hippocampus. So yeah, I I have read that paper. Yes, and I I think we do cite them in the uh, in the paper. Um, Yep. So yeah, so I I, I uh, definitely learned a lot from that paper. Uh, I haven't probably read the paper, uh, the other paper, uh, the P uh, PNS paper uh, Brad mentioned. Uh, yeah, it's very um, specific. I have, I, have to go and, <laughs> I have to go and read that. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 the question stands. So 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 in his yes. you know like in his clustering methods, you can basically make new clusters at will, right? And Got so it. this is in contrast to um, your cloning method, where you have a set number of clones. Yeah. So, so what we uh, figured out, and and this is you know this is just one version of the algorithms that we uh, published. We we have other versions uh, cooking uh, to various level of maturity. So in in all the problems that we dealt with in that paper, you could just over allocate the clones. So you can you can just allocate the clones to some you know uh, large capacity, and it would uh, the learning algorithm would figure out the right amount of clones to use. So there was no not much harm just over allocating the number of clones and and a lot of the capacity will just remain unused so, because the learning algorithm itself has some regularization in it so we do have some some kind of dirichlet like smoothing in the in the model uh, so that it it kind of decides how much of the capacity to use and how much how much to leave unused and yes we w- want to have uh, future versions of this one to be able to even generate clones uh, mm-hmm. as as it goes uh, uh maybe uh, you know uh, motivated by the neurogenesis uh, in in the hippocampus and mm-hmm. we have played around with that but none of those were uh needed for the problems that we tackle in the paper so we didn't we, so we just wanted to add the right amount of bells and whistles to uh, get, get the the basic version of the model out uh, these other versions are in the works but what what is interesting is that you can just over allocate, and uh, so if you just under allocate, it will still work. But you know, it will be like a it, the the mod the model will over generalize um, mm-hmm. if you if you under allocate the number of clones. Uh, but if you uh, if you over allocate, it doesn't overfit. It 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 still has some regularization built in into the learning algorithm mm-hmm. that it just leaves the other capacity unused. And we have uh, played with the Dirichlet priors to make it much more uh, rigorous in 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 formulation, but we just chose not to put that into the into the this first version of the paper. I mean, you mentioned um, Yuri Buzaki earlier, and um, having a set number of clones harkens to his notion that basically what what the brain what we have in the brain anyway is a pre-allocated empty dictionary waiting to be filled and. Uh, the, it, its capacity, essentially, like you just said, will will never be used if you create enough clones, or in the brain, if you have enough um, trajectories, uh, you can store essentially an infinite amount of sequences. And um, I don't know if there, if you see the similarities there. Yeah, uh, correct. So that's the setting that we want to be in. You you over allocate the number of clones, and then uh, when you learn, uh, initially it might be using all the clones. But then you consolidate it such that now the the, the clones are free for learning something new, yeah. uh, and and uh, it's almost like it's the pressure of learning something new that forces consolidation on the the old clones. Um, so the, when the new thing comes in, the older learning compresses further and consolidates further, um, and that's ideally the setting that we want to be in. Uh, so we have another version of this algorithm. It's uh, we we had a short paper in CCN where. You you can rapidly learn the sequences and then uh, compress them as gradually uh, as new sequences come in. So basically, in the in the current paper uh, we are reading, um, the learning is still batch, right? We are we are uh, taking all the sequences and uh, playing them repeatedly to the uh, the model. Uh, but you can learn incrementally as sequences come in. Um, so that's another version of the algorithm that we are working on uh, mm-hmm. and. And that's the setting that we want to be in. Basically, over allocate the clones and learn incrementally, and and it should figure out 
how to use the uh, the clones appropriately as more data comes in. Hmm. I mean, it, it does seem to overlap actually with uh, with Brad's work on the the clustering. They don't seem mutually exclusive. Correct, correct. In fact, um, the that clustering algorithm should fit. So we we explicitly took each observation as an atomic uh, thing. You know, each mm-hmm. observation is atomic, and then we are learning sequences of these atomic things. But each observation can have components to it, and that's where the the clustering algorithm comes in. So that that fits uh, along with our model. Uh, below that, um, saying okay. Each observation has multiple components to it, and and there is a clustering that happening in purely in that observation space without using the without using the temporal context. Okay, well, he has one more question. Are you ready for it? <laughs> yes. Okay. The second question concerns how goals and rewards shape representations in your model. Your model seems to effectively compress the trips through the space. In concept learning, rather than a straightforward compression. The assignment of stimuli to categories shapes how all stimuli are represented in the hippocampus. Analogously, reward signals can alter place and grid cell activity. How would these signals enter into your model to shape the learned or inferred representations? Thank you, and I'm really excited for this episode to come out and wish you success with this exciting work. All right, there you go. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, this is great uh, that you are getting these questions up front. That is that is so cool. <laughs> it's, oh yeah, it's kind of fun. I'm not. I'm not. I don't know how well it's uh, you know working out, but but I, I I told Brad I thought it'd be fun if if he also pre-recorded his responses to your responses, and then I tried to pick them out really quickly based on your responses, and that would be oh, just wow. a fun mess. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, that that is cool. Um, but, yeah. yeah. So in the current model, the reward signals are just treated as sensory signals. We have an experiment based on a real hippocampus experiment where the la- the rat is running laps uh, and at the end of the fourth lap it gives a re- gets a reward mm-hmm. but that that reward at the end of the fourth lap in our case is just a different observation and so in that way it affects the learning because it's a different observation so the since it is getting a different observation at the end of the 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 fourth lap compared to any other laps it affects what representation it learns so it's it's an indirect, just converting reward to observation kind of uh, thing. We yeah. do want to see whether there are more reward related representations, but we haven't tackled that yet. So right mm-hmm. now, no, it's it just treated just like an observation and observations affect learning. That's the way it affects uh, learning currently. Well, all right. Thanks, Brad, for the, for the questions. And uh, thanks to Leap for answering them. I appreciate you going back and talking about the inspiration from the hippocampus and how uh, the model is... Uh, addressing hippocampal function. Do you think it's worthwhile for you to go through just an example of one of the tasks uh, it performs? You, you were just talking about the the lap task, for instance. I, I just don't want to, you know, give short shrift to all of the, the various different things that it does. So I thought maybe yeah. you could pick one of your favorites or something and, and just describe it. So this is my current favorite. It is not in the paper, but, it, you know, it, I can still okay. explain it. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so... You know, there are all these phenomena um, which uh, were thought of as uh, space-related. Um, so one example is this bound idea of boundary vector cells. Um, so the experiment, uh, the uh, the experiments in the uh, rat is the rats are exposed to a, a room. They learn in a particular room, and now you in that room you form they form place fields. So you now take the place field in some location, corresponding to some location, you know, x equal to 2, y equal to 3, something like that. Uh, and now uh, enlarge the room, you know, let the let the rats run mm-hmm. in an enlarged room. Now you can ask the question, how does the place field of, uh, for, of that neuron, which was representing 2-3, uh, uh, location 2-3, now how does that change? All right. Does, sorry, um, does, does everything get scaled as you enlarge it or is it uh, adding just, on to the just, space? Uh, elongating the room. So, so think of it as, you know, the, the room was five by five before, and now the room is, uh, five by 10. So it is elongating on one dimension. But it, there's not like some sort of <clears throat> pattern within the room that gets scaled up or something. No, it's, in so it's a, the, um, the room is black, empty in the middle, right? Okay. So, so okay. it's just, you know, so if it's a uniform carpet, it just gets extended. Gotcha. Um, so the, the boundaries move further out, right? That's, uh, that's the experimental setting. Um, so now, uh, the, this, you know, and, and the observation is that the place fields 
split. Uh, so it it will it will form two. Uh, it, it, it will it will become bimodal and and uh, it will now respond highly in two locations and in in between those two locations it will have weak response. So this is the observation. These are these are so called splitter cells. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh no, this is not a splitter cell. This oh, is okay. the this is the boundary vector cell. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and the reason is that this this phenomenon is explained using boundaries and vector coding. Uh, so you know you you can think of this as you know this this looks like a purely spatial phenomenon. You know you have to think about Euclidean space and vectors in the Euclidean space, etc. And what is fascinating is that we can we can explain this without that. We can you know it's just take our model do the pure sequence learning that happens in the model and mm -hmm. you know when you mm -hmm. learn it in one room uh with you know uh the walls and the blank middle it will learn place fields but now when you expand the room uh it will split exactly like what is predicted uh you know what what came from the experiments you know um so it, it will become by model but now it, it you know it is not using any of the the space concepts it's not using you know special boundary cells or special vector cells uh, in the model, it is it is it is coming naturally out of pure sequence learning. And thinking about space as pure sequence is something that takes a little bit of practice. That's what I realized because when you think about modeling space, people naturally think about grids. You know, naturally think yep. about yep. Uh, oh uh, a, a Markov random field with one node associated with each location. That's the way people think about modeling space. But what is Counterintuitive uh, is that oh the the space can be modeled purely as sequence and many of the uh, hippocampal phenomena that we see uh, are arising out of modeling space as a sequence. So examples are you know as I said boundary vector cells and there are similar examples using landmark vector cells. So when you when you learn using a set of landmarks and then you move the landmark. In 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 a, in the test setting, how does the place field change? Uh, you know that's called the landmark vector cell. But again, in our model, it, the same thing happens, but it's the same mechanism. No no different mechanism needs to be postulated. And then the idea of splitter cells. Uh, this is where the rat is not taking a random walk. The rat is moving on. A, you know, so there is a shared path. Think of like an H maze. The rat starts mm -hmm. from one one uh, the left arm of the maze and goes to uh, the left arm and uh, then uh, on the top and uh, um, the rat starts from the lower right arm and goes to the the you know top right arm uh -huh. uh, during that uh, traversal it is passing through the middle of the the uh, uh, age oh, so wait so it starts on the left and goes to the right and starts on the right oh, and goes so, to the left oh, sorry this is a horizontal age okay <laughs> so <laughs> oh, oh okay yeah, yeah sorry <laughs> sorry so, uh, okay, let me let it's me, an let audio me repeat. podcast <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Just draw so it. So let for me, me. Uh, <laughs> repeat that. Let me let me call it an uh, I maze. So not an H maze, an okay. I maze. Okay. I. okay, okay. <laughs> so yeah. uh, uh, so it's a it's a capital letter I, and yep. you know, so you have the 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 lower uh, limb and the, the upper limb, and um, so if you uh, the rat takes two routes through this maze. So one, it starts from the lower left and goes to the upper left. And then the rat start can start from the lower right and go to the upper right. And in these two routes, the midsection is overlapping. So they are getting the same observations when they are passing through the mid uh, uh, midsection, right? But um, what it turns out that the rat learns um, different, you know, so they, they learn different set of cells in that middle path. And mm. those these cells are called the splitter cells because it's the same observation. But the rat responds, to, you know, depending on where the starting point was. If it started from the left, only some subset of these cells will be active. Mm -hmm. it's, if it started from the right, only a, a, another subset of the cells are active. Um, so, so that's, that those are called the splitter cells. And again, that in our model is just different clones for different uh, contexts, uh, because starting from the left or starting from the right are different contexts. Um, yeah, based on the different sequences that the rat has to. Exactly. Exactly. So, so it's it's purely uh, you know purely sequence learning explains that, and uh, similarly a very related phenomena and uh, is um, very recent work from uh, Chen Sun. Uh, uh, he's the first author. 
So this is with the lap running task where the lap uh, the, the rat runs four laps at the end of the fourth lap there is a reward and and what he's uh, showing is that so he calls it uh, th their lab calls this even specific representation so you can you when you look at the hippocampal responses you see one set of neurons responding according to which lap it is in although all the laps are getting the same observation you know lap one number one is the same as lap number two but you see one set of neurons responding to which lap uh, it is in. So you'll see, okay, this set of neurons are highly active in the first lap. Another set of neurons are highly active in the second lap. But you also see that the same set of neurons that were highly active in the first lap are also partially active in the second lap. And and sim similarly, so you, you see that hippocampal trace and you get the almost identical hippocampal trace out of our model. Because what happens is that when the model runs in this, you know, is exposed to these sequences, it will learn different clones for these different four labs, although it's the same observation. Uh, and then the other clones, uh, during inference, the other clones will be partially active. That's a property of the model, that the, the, the correct clone will be, you know, the, the strongest active, but the other clones will be partially active because it's a probabilistic model and there is a bit of smoothing in it. And that is the right uh, behavior uh, from the model. Um, so it is. It was fascinating to see that this is the hippocampal recording. Uh, when I, sh you know, there are in in the company there are people who who do not read neuroscience literature, right? They they see neuroscience literature only through me. They are they are pure, pure machine learning people, right? Sure. So when I when I showed that figure from Chen Sun's uh, paper. Uh, and they're like, this is an actual recording. This is <laughs> that was the question that I have because awesome. that, that yeah. uh, because it is we we knew that that almost exact same thing will happen in our model. So it was yeah. it was so surprising to uh, for them to see that oh you can actually record from hippocampus to this level of detail and 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 uh, have traces which almost matches the model. Yeah, that's impressive. That's that's, that's really awesome. I mean, summing it summing it all up, how do you? How would you describe your thoughts on what the hippocampus does? <laughs> pure sequence learning. <laughs> I mean, is that it? Is it pure sequence learning? Is that is that in a, in a nutshell? Uh, the, yeah, that's. Uh, I I like that uh, simplifying, unifying view that you know grid cells. You know, I, I'll keep um, grid cells. I'll you know I'll come to grid cells in a while. But if you take the grid cells out of the picture, the grid cells are not in hippocampus as I as I understand. Grid cells are in uh, MEC or something, you know. I'm not. I'm not even familiar with all the Internal whole anatomy of cortex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so if you if you just uh, look at uh, hippocampus and ig ignore the grid cells, I think it is pure sequence learning. Mm. Uh, and and I like that simplifying view uh, from uh, Yuri and uh, many others. You know, just makes it easier to deal with. Um, and uh, of course, pure sequence learning. What with the clustering in, you know, the spatial clustering in, in between, um, mm -hmm. so that, so that the inputs can be clustered and sequenced. So the, I would put hippocampus definitely in that, uh, and all the, so sequence learning is, of course, associated with consolidation, uh, planning, all of those things come naturally with that sequence learning, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so all of them will put in, uh, be put in that bucket. Now, uh, grid cells, I think are one hack that, uh, brain has figured out to be able to model uh, space where, you know, to tile space uh, from, you know, so b based on uh, path integration signals, you can tile space so that even if the observations are blank from the, from the visual system, you can still have something which is from mm. the path integration signals. Um, that's the way I think about grid cells. But of course, these two things interact with each other, right? So, yeah. so the grid cells influence play cells and play cells influence grid cells. So when you see them working together, you will, of course, see some influence of the play cells on the grid cells because it's, you know, it's a, it's a bidirectional influence in a graphical model. Uh, so we do hope to fit grid cells into the picture at some point, but mm -hmm. that's not something we are actively working on. Okay, man. So we I, I, there's another exciting piece of work that you have that we're not going to have time to go into, but... Um, it is basically modeling the cortical microcircuits, the canonical cortical microcircuits, using uh, back to your going back to your RCN models that you've been developing that we talked about last time that solved the captchas and that uh, yeah. I don't know if you uh, that that was sort of the uh, the media uh, story about what those did I suppose right 
Got it. <laughs> yeah. And um, I guess I'm media too. So that's what we <laughs> talked about. So um, but anyway, the, the paper is called A Detailed Mathematical Theory of Thalamic and Cortical Microcircuits based on inference in a generative vision model. And the, the generative vi- vision model are, are the is based on the RCN uh, networks. And um, so I'm, I'm going to have to have you back on uh, the show to talk about that because, so this is the elusive canonical uh, cortical microcircuit that um, th- this is another area where I, there's a lot of work these days. So this is what, what that work is addressing. And, and we can go deeper on that next time you're back. What are your AI colleagues who don't care about neuroscience? What do they think about you working on having an account of of thalamic of the thalamus and and what it's doing, you know, versus your neuroscience colleagues? I and mean, of course, we uh, we care and and we think, oh, this is important. But do your AI colleagues think, Dilip, like, who, what are you doing? Who cares? <laughs> uh, well, some of them uh, have started caring because it is fascinating. Uh, um, and, okay. and uh, so, uh, because one of my closest collaborators is Miguel. Uh, he's he's I would say pure machine learning person. He doesn't read the biology papers, but uh, he reads biology papers vicariously through me. Uh, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, but he's definitely fascinated by it that you can actually find connections uh, to the brain. And uh, for example, the the uh, um, remark about that hippocampal traces was by him that, oh, wow, this is to this level, you can go into the brain because what often machine learning people might miss is that people have done a lot of clever experiments about the brain. And if you go with the go with the right lens to interpret those experiments and, you know, and go with the right attitude to see, can I find reusable principles from all these things? You can. And that's often some a lesson that is missed in machine learning, I think. But since we have uh, many of these machine learning people work in close uh, collaboration with people who are on neuroscience and you know people who are on both sides, yeah, you, they, they can appreciate that a lot more. I, I want to ask about the importance of learning the neural implementations and the constraints within the brain and how that informs your algorithmic thinking and your computational level thinking and you know whether it's important or or do the constraints in the brain really just play a confirmatory role to say uh okay we have the, all these great algorithms and look okay yes you can do it in brains because you must be able to do it in brains and this is how you can do it i confirm that the algorithm uh can happen in brains it, it, like what is the in in your own thinking process how do the, how do these different levels interact it's it's dire- definitely bidirectional. It is not just confirmatory. Like you know, many of our uh, representational choices in our algorithmic model and the computational model was informed by reading neuroscience literature. And in fact, there were times when we were stuck. Okay, this this one seems to be a hard problem, and uh, without some information from uh, neuroscience, there is a large field of uh, models uh, to be explored. Mm. In on some of those things, for example, uh, how border ownership might be represented in a hierarchy. Uh, we were actually stuck for a while. Um, what got us unstuck was reading some papers from uh, Wander Height, um, who has studied uh, border ownership responses uh, and proto objects uh, in the in the brain. So for us, at least, you know, we uh, maybe we have figured out some mechanism of. Uh, reading neuroscience papers that look for specific questions, uh, and and because of that, it has been very fruitful for us that um, neuroscience gives very actionable insights into building models. I mean, you, you, I mean, obviously, you have computational level processes in mind when you're thinking, uh, when you're exploring the implementation level type stuff, and and even the algorithms. But but is it fair to say that they're all mutually informative? Yeah, there. I, I think of the, you know. So we think of these as three corners of a triangle. Um, so there is neurophysiology, uh, you know, neuroanatomy. Uh, all of those experiments is one corner of one one corner, and the, another corner is properties of the real world data, uh, you know, real world benchmarks, all of those things. And the third one is just computational algorithms. You know, the mm-hmm. things that we know about graphical models, neural networks, properties of algorithms. So all these three pieces are mutual constraints. And the brain is the way it is because of some properties of the world. And those properties can be exploited in our algorithms. So when you can, when we go uh, look at the brain for insights, 
we want to find this uh, triangle. We want to see what are the all, all three pieces of the puzzle, mm. and and that's when we consider that as okay. That is a that is a real uh, insight that we can use. And you you know that 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 that's a promising track of uh, of progress. Then is that is that Got the it. deal? Yeah. Okay. Finally, Dilip, and and I want to have you on. We'll have you on again uh, before two years. Uh, yes, uh, ne- next <laughs> that time. would be great. <laughs> but but if if you're thinking of someone, th- you know, imagining someone in a laboratory, in a neuroscience laboratory, let's say, or computate any, I say neuroscience with the broad swath of natural intelligence laboratories and and labs out there, uh, and they're thinking about they they either have a great AI startup idea, or they're thinking about going into industry, and whether they're thinking about starting their own startup. Or, or maybe going to work for a start startup. Do you have any uh, advice for them that maybe you see recurring that you wish uh, people who applied for your, you know, company applied for Vicarious, you you wish they had more of or less of or or something like that? Yeah, uh, I would say definitely get very good at coding and learn to enjoy coding and and <laughs> building things. So so that that I would say as definitely a uh, one thing to and if you're Looking to start a company, uh, find a great co-founder. Uh, that mm. would be another another advice I can uh, I can give because having a great uh, co-founder can make things a lot smoother. Did you get lucky with Scott Phoenix, or was yes, is, yes, okay. Well, see, that, <laughs> how do you find uh, what you're saying is get lucky, right? Yes. Oh, that's <laughs> that's general advice for everything. Right? You know, a lot of it is luck. Uh, so. Well, sure, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are uh, lucky to have graced your presence again, Dilip. So thanks for coming on the show again, and we'll talk soon again. So I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot for having me. And I hope I will come back again before two years. <laughs> <laughs> Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time.